If you were to ask students the question, what exactly is big O notation, you might get a variety of answers. One student inevitably will mention that it tells you the efficiency of an algorithm. With some further probing, another student might bring up the concept of how it tells you the growth of an algorithm. You might respond by asking some more specifics, and then out of nowhere you get hit with the following hideous but accurate definition. Disgusting. To be fair, I'm exaggerating here, but I do believe when big O notation is taught for the first time to a broader audience, we tend to get bogged down in the details. In this video, I want to take a step back and take some time to appreciate the story behind big O notation. In this video, we will unravel the details of the story, demystify the definition of big O in a visual manner, define practical steps for how to find the big O runtime of an algorithm, and then wrap up with a fun example of these steps in action. All stories revolve around problems and characters. In this story, here is the problem. You want to find all sets of non-negative integers a, b, and c that sum to a particular n. Our main characters are two students, Alice and Bob. Both of them try to solve this problem and present the following solutions. In Bob's solution, he decides to try every combination of a, b, and c up to n, and whenever a plus b plus c is equal to n, he prints out a, b, and c. Here's a quick example of how his algorithm plays out for input n equals 3. Alice spends a little bit more time trying to solve this problem and comes up with the following approach. She realizes that since n is a specific value that's given to us, she can actually try every combination of a and b up to n, and then for each combination set c to be equal to n minus a plus b. If the c value set is non-negative, then she has found a valid combination. Here's how her algorithm plays out for the same n equals 3 input. Now imagine you're an objective judge here, and you're asked, which student has the better algorithm? The crux of this question lies in the understanding of how computer scientists measure the efficiency of algorithms. So let's come up with ways that we can figure this out. The simplest idea would be to actually physically time each algorithm for a particular input. On my computer, for example, I timed each algorithm separately on an input of n equals 10,000 and found that Bob's solution ran in about 58 seconds and Alice's solution ran in about 15 seconds. We could be even more robust if we wish and tabulate the time measurements for various inputs. And we could then compare the two algorithms on a variety of data points. Additionally, if we really wanted to go all out with comparison, we could put these values on a graph to see approximately how the time grows as a function of the input. One note about graphing is that it's easier to put our x-axis on a logarithmic scale for visualization. And this is what the graph of time versus input looks like for these two approaches. And this is all a very, very reasonable way to measure the efficiency. It seems pretty clear from the graph at least that Alice's solution is noticeably better than Bob's. But there's one glaring problem. Take a second to think about why this might not be the best way to measure efficiency. The first glaring issue is that this method is really annoying. I mean, let's be real, no one wants to wait hours for an algorithm to finish and get one data point. The second big issue here is that all these time measurements are taken on one specific computer. On another computer, these data points may completely change. For example, on a supercomputer, the time to execute these tasks might be much lower for both algorithms. This issue hints at something we call machine dependence. A true and pure efficiency measurement should be machine independent. When someone asks you how fast an algorithm is, you don't want to give them a measurement that might only be true for your computer. You want to give them a sense for how fast it is regardless of what machine it runs on. So let's go back to the drawing board and see if we can come up with something that's more machine independent. So another option is we could actually try to count some sort of operation in the program and see how that changes as the input increases. We want to focus on the worst case scenario for good representation. For example, one thing we could count is the number of times we check the respective if statement in each program. Let's look at n equals 20. In Bob's program, we can check the if condition for all a values from 0 to 20 inclusive, 
all B values from 0 to 20, and then all C values from 0 to 20. This ends up being a total of 21 cubed. When n equals 40, we end up with 41 cubed as a count by a similar calculation. And we can take a few more data points for comprehensiveness. Now let's take a look at Alice's algorithm. For n equals 20, we have 21 values of a, 21 values of b, and now the defining feature of Alice's algorithm is that for each pair of a and b, we have exactly one c value. This now gives us a total of 21 squared for the count. And the pattern is similar for other n values, which we can also add to the table for our completeness. All right, so let's take a step back and analyze this measure. What we really like about the scheme for measuring efficiency is that it's completely machine independent. Even on a supercomputer, these counts are not going to change. But is there anything we don't like? This might be more subtle, but one thing that's not great about the scheme is we don't really have a good sense for how the algorithm grows as the input increases. If someone tells you Bob's algorithm runs around 1 million operations on an input of n equals 100, you're probably like, okay, that's good to know, but what if n is equal to 1,000? What if n is equal to 10,000? It's hard for you to estimate that by looking at this table of counts. And another big complaint you have with this measurement is that, once again, it takes a lot of effort to put together. We want to find something that gives us the essence of how the algorithm performs without too much work. We also want to focus on communicating how the algorithm grows over time. So there's actually a pretty easy fix to this. Instead of figuring out the count for a specific n value, let's generalize to any n. So looking at the previous calculations for any n, Bob's algorithm is now going to iterate through n plus 1 a values, n plus 1 b values, and n plus 1 c values for a total of n plus 1 cubed times. And Alice's algorithm similarly has a generalized count of n plus 1 squared, since we now only have one specific c value for each a and b value. So now we have a general expression for how each algorithm operates for any n value. Great. But can we simplify more? Well, if what we care about is how the program performs as the input grows, what really matters in the long run is the worst case performance when n is very large. When n is very large, the lower order terms become so relatively small when compared with the higher order terms that we can essentially ignore them. Even though we lose some technical accuracy, we will take the added simplicity. Bringing this all together, this final single term for each of these algorithms encapsulates what we call the running time of an algorithm, and computer scientists use a special notation called big O notation to express the approximations and simplifications we just went through. Using this notation, we can now say that Alice's algorithm is indeed more efficient than Bob's because it runs in O of n squared time, which grows at a much slower pace than Bob's solution, which is O of n cubed. And this is the story of big O notation that no one really tells you about. The biggest takeaways here is that we tried many different measurement ideas, all of which had some good features, but also some really annoying features. We slowly took away those annoying features one by one and ended up with something that looked like big O notation. All right, so now that we've introduced big O notation, I want to take some time to dispel some common points of confusion that you may encounter while learning this topic. If you ever read about big O notation in a computer science textbook, you might see the following definition. Let f of n and g of n be functions from positive integers to positive reals. We say that f is equal to O of g if there is a constant c greater than zero that such that f of n is less than or equal to c times g of n. Wow, that's hard to say. Looking at this definition, it's understandable if your first reaction is what in the world is going on here. Let's take a moment to deconstruct this definition. First off, another way to read the second half of this function in more layman's terms is that f of n grows no faster than g of n. Second, f of n and g of n are just functions. So let's use an example to clear things up. 
Suppose f of n is a random function like 3n squared plus 5n plus 4. We know from our simplified understanding of big O notation that this should be O of n squared because the most dominant term here is the n squared term and we don't care about constants. This means that our respective g of n function should be n squared. So how does this fit in with this complicated definition? Well, this definition states that if f of n is equal to o of g of n, then there must be a constant c greater than zero, such that f of n is less than or equal to c times g of n. So let's graph these two functions and see if we can find a valid c. Right now, c is equal to one. If we increase c to three, we get the following graph, which is not quite to the point where we reach our condition. But now if we bump it up to c equals four, we clearly have c times g of n greater than f of n. And this also shows that the big O notation for this could never be something like O of n, since there is no constant that exists in the world that would make c times n greater than our function f of n for large enough n. The large enough n part of this definition is really key here. For example, when c is equal to 30, even though it might look like c times g of n is greater than f of n, for a section of the graph, there will eventually be a large enough n where this is not true. For those of you who have seen limits before, another helpful way to think about big O notation is that if f is equal to O of g, then it must be true that the limit as n goes to infinity of g of n over f of n must be equal to some constant c where c is greater than zero. Once again, with this perspective, the big O notation for this function must be O of n squared. The next thing I want to talk about is how we actually go about finding the running times of various functions. One nice thing about finding running times is for almost all types of problems you'll see, the big O runtime will fall into one of the following six classes. From best to worst, the classes are constant, logarithmic, linear, linear rhythmic, polynomial, or exponential. You might see some others on occasion, but a good majority of the algorithms you will encounter will fall into these classes. Let's now go over some steps to actually find the big O runtime of an algorithm. To figure out what the running time is, the first thing you should do is make sure you understand what an algorithm is actually doing. I know, sounds obvious, but you would be surprised how easy it is to fall into the trap of trying to guesstimate running time. But always try to ask yourself practical questions such as the following before you dive deeper. Second, we want to find some basic units to count as we did earlier. Good things to count are things like the number of times something is printed, number of times a variable has been assigned, number of iterations, etc. We want this basic unit to be something that encapsulates the worst case of a function. What that means is we want to find the operations that will execute the most as the input becomes very large. Lastly, we want to match the growth of our counting unit as the input becomes very large to the class of runtimes that most closely represent this growth. Let's now see these three steps in action with an example. Suppose we were asked to find the running time of the following function. Let's start with step one. The function doesn't look too complicated. We see that it's a recursive function with a base case of n equals one and a recursive case that returns the sum of two recursive calls to f on n minus one. The next step is to identify a simple unit that we should count. Here, the most reasonable option seems to be to count the number of calls to the function f of n. Let's take a look at a few example inputs and get a sense of these counts. For n equals one, we have exactly one call to the function f on the input one. For n equals two, we have a call to f of two, which then calls f of one and adds it to another f of one call. This leads to a total of three calls. If we now try the same approach to f of three, you might start to see a pattern. f of three makes a call to f of two, which then makes two calls to f of one, which is the base case. After getting the answer to f of two, we have to make another call to f of two to find the answer to f of three. That second call to f of two leads to the same outcomes as the previous call to f of two. We end up with a total of seven calls after going through this. We also get a nice symmetrical tree diagram. We can actually use a symmetry to help us calculate future counts. 
Here's what happens when n equals 4. f of 4 makes 2 calls to f of 3, which gives us the following tree. For the count, we know from previous calculations what the count of f of 3 is. There are two calls to f of 3 and one new call to f of 4. So the total number of calls ends up being two times the seven calls that resulted from f of 3 plus the new f of 4 call. And this gives us a total of 15. And for the count of n equals 5, we can use the same idea. We have two f of 4 calls, making the tree diagram look like the following. The count is two times the number of calls from f of 4 plus one for the new f of 5 call giving us a total of 31 calls. All right, so now that we have a good understanding of how the counts work, let's see if we can map the count to an appropriate class of runtimes. There are a couple ways of doing this. One quick way is to utilize our earlier pattern to note that every time we increase by one, the count roughly increases by a factor of two. This is a classic indicator that we have exponential growth, specifically of the order of two to the power of n. Another more sound mathematical way to formalize this is that for any general n equals k, our count is 2 to the power of k minus 1, which using our rules for big O notation is O of 2 to the power of n. The biggest takeaway from this example is that a lot of running time questions may require you to draw diagrams to help you determine the counts for various inputs, and these diagrams can actually directly help you identify the overall growth. If there's any universal rule in problem solving, whether in computer science or not, drawing things out will never hurt. So to recap this video, we first started off with unraveling the story behind Big O notation and why this idea makes sense as a tool. We saw how it's more machine independent than tools like timing algorithms, and we also saw how it's more simple than complicated tabulations and mathematical expressions for operation counts. We then went through and demystified the textbook definition of big O by showing how this definition can be understood visually. We then went through the steps you can apply to find the runtime of various algorithms and then applied these steps to one specific function to see them in action. Thanks for watching me and as always, I'd appreciate it if you hit the like button if you enjoyed it. If you want to see more content like this, be sure to hit the subscribe button. And if you want to more directly support this channel, be sure to check out the Patreon page linked in the description below. See you in the next video.